I'm going to challenge you before I start preaching. Don't miss your opportunity. God is in the house. The healer is in the house. The Savior is in the house. The one who can take sin out of your life and cast it as far as the east is to the west, as deep as the seas are. He's in the house today. He's in the house. Let's give Jesus a hand today. God bless you. God is good. You can be seated real quick. i got to do what I feel in the Holy Ghost. First of all, I want to thank everybody for being here today. We had a lot of visitors, and I call names. I miss somebody. I don't want to miss nobody. I'm excited that you're here. Uh, but today I'm going to do something a little different. Brother Pat, and I want you to go sit with your wife. And uh, I want my family to come to the stage, Sister Hunt. And I'm going to ask my daughter-in-laws my, to bring the babies, my sons to come that are here. I want you all to join me on the platform today. Praise God. Grab your chair, guys. When you come up, grab your chair. You can sit over to the side. I won't put you right in front of the camera. I'll let you sit over here. But I want my family on the stage today. Praise God. And I want you, as my family is coming, I want you to go sit with your family. I know it's a lot of people here and there's different areas, but I want you to go sit by your family or try to get as close as you can to your family. Move by your mom, move by your dad. Go ahead, kids, get as close as you can to mom and dad today. You're going to have to sit by dad today and mom today. I want everybody to be with your family. And I know some families are not here, and uh, I want you guys to move where your mom and dad is. This is going to be important. Time I get done preaching, you're going to wish you had listened to what Brother Pastor Hunt said. Praise God. Holly, go where your family is today. And, and uh, those of you who don't have family here, can I adopt you? Can you be my family today? I want you to know, I want everybody to be part of the family. Come on up, guys. Set them right here on, on this platform. Uh, TJ and, and the grandchild can have the soft seat. Praise the Lord. Let's give my family a hand. Don't I have a good-looking family today? Praise the Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. I'll tell you what I want for Christmas later. Praise the Lord. But I want to preach today on families. This is family month. And how many, how many knows that there are a lot of dysfunctional families in this world? How many knows your family is one of them? How many knows my family is one of them? We all have some dysfunctional things going on in our life, and I'm going to preach that, that today with my family standing behind me because I want you to know I've been here 14 years, almost 15 years, and I've had a family behind me. They have stood behind me, and they have, been threatened, they have threatened to fight for me. They have helped me in, in hard times and in low times. Sometimes we felt like choking each other. And uh, when you have a good family, that's what happens because we can talk about each other, but you can't talk about us. It's almost like my boys, I remember when my boys were growing up, they fought so bad that I, I thought, man, they're going to hurt each other bad. I'm talking about fist blows, slamming each other's head on the concrete floors. And I remember fights. I remember my sister Hunt got involved in one of them one time. She got hurt, and Daddy had to come alive at that moment. But, but those things happen. But I tell you this, as much as you guys fought, and I've also seen them get jumped by somebody else, and they begin to take up for each other. But you don't mess. Everybody look at your, your spouse or somebody. You don't mess with my family. You don't, you know, Sister Hunt's a sweet lady. All y'all know she's sweet. She, I told you the other day, she takes up for somebody if they kill somebody. It doesn't matter. She just, she's a sweet lady. But if you mess with her family, you will see a lion come out that will roar so loud. And it was, it was so loud, it would scare you. And, but you know why? Because you don't mess with her family. Family's something that we need to stay close to. Friend, I don't care how much uh, disagreement you've had with your child. I don't care how much disagreement you have with your mom and dad. You can't change the fact that they're your child and that they're your mom and dad. You can't change it. It doesn't matter what happens. And, and today I'm going to preach. I've got a mighty long sermon that I'm going to try to condense down in about two hours and be out of here. But, but, but today I want to preach on dysfunctional, the dysfunctional family. And I'm going to read out of Genesis, if you want to turn your Bibles there with me. Genesis uh, chapter 27. And right, get right into a story of a defunct, dysfunctional family today. And uh, we're going to talk about this family here in a few moments in our, in our sermon. But I want to read uh, 27 and 1 of Genesis. And 1 through 4, then we're going to skip down a few verses to about verse number 30. But he says, And it came to pass that when Isaac was old, and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, that he called Esau his eldest son and said unto him, My son, and he said unto him, Behold, here I am I. And he said, Behold, now I am old, but I, I know not that the day of, of my death. 
Now therefore take, verse 3 here, he said, Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go out into the field, and I want you to take me some venture. In other words, son, I want you to go do what you do best. And I want you to go out there and prepare something for me. Listen to what he says in verse 4. And make me a, a savor of meat such as I love and bring it to me and I may eat and that I, my soul may bless thee before I die. Then don't skip down to verse 30. Save a little time for you standing. And it came to pass as soon as he, Isaac had made an end of the blessing, Jacob and, 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 uh, Jacob and Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, and that Esau, his brother, came in from him hunting. And he also had made Savior meat and brought it to his father. And said unto his father, let my, let my father arise and eat of the son's vision, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac, his father, said unto him, Who art thou? And he says, I am thy son, thy firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembling very exceedingly and said, Who? Where is he that hath taken vision, vengeance and brought unto me? And I have eaten of the four, and has camus, and has blessed him. Yea, and thou blessed. And he, in verse 34, And Esau heard the words of his father. He cried with a great exceeding bitter cry and said unto him, Father, bless me, even me also, O oh, my father. And he said, My, my, thy brother, I have with subtlety and hath taken away thy blessing. I want you to lay your Bibles down behind you and help me pray for a minute, if you could, Lord. I love you again. I thank you for this great time to worship your name. You are a great God, Lord. I'm nothing without you, God. I need help for you to help me to preach, God. I am nothing, Lord, and I'm just a, a vessel that wants to carry your word and tell folks what you have. And I pray that you use it today as you multiply your word in everyone's heart. In the name of Jesus and the church, said Amen. God bless you. you can be seated. Most often we hear the word dysfunctional applied a lot of times to human relationships. And we hear of dysfunctional families, and that's what we're talking about today. But we hear of these, and we also hear of dysfunctional marriages. And you, you can find dozens of books, and I begin to, I saw a bunch of them online, and I just wrote down a, a four or five of them. But you can find dozens of books on dysfunctional uh, titles. And I found some that said, Secret of Dysfunctional Family. Healing dysfunctional marriage, overcoming dysfunctional childhood, dysfunctional relationships is one of them. Uh, where they come from and and how they change, how they can be changed. The book says. But today I want to talk just simply on the dysfunctional family. And today dysfunctional family is one. And and I'll be honest, we is is we all don't like to talk bad about our family, but every family in here can find some dysfunctional in it. And I'm going to tell you, if you look at my, my family tree, it's a messed up tree. Whew, oh, God, it's messed up. But you know what? It's still a family. It's still something God had ordained and put together. I had no choice who my mom was going to be. I had no choice who my dad and my brothers were going to be. I didn't get to uh, have a survey. And God had put those in those areas in that way for a reason. And there are five symptoms of dysfunctional families today. And this is what I found. And one of them was in, in strange, or estrangement, a family member who avoids uh, other family members. And we see that quite often we avoid because we don't want to be a part of what we call drama or terrible situations. Or if somebody makes an idea we don't like, we kind of avoid it. And so it becomes an estrangement in our families. And then there's a number two was anger, which it, it may be expressed or repressed. And number three was lack of trust. Sometimes it's hard to trust a family member if they've ever done you wrong, if you know what I'm talking about. If they've ever lied or cheated or stolen, it's hard to build that trust back. And number four is deception, and it's in, that's the ability to speak the truth other family member, to, about other family members. And the last one tonight that I found, or today that I found, is unhealthy secrecy. I tell you tonight, right up front, or today before I really get into preaching this sermon, my wife and I have no secrets. So if you've ever told me something, I probably have told my wife. Because there's no secret in me and my wife. We tell each other everything. But why do you do that, Brother Hunt? Because I know who's going to pray with me. I know who's going to stay with me. I know who's going to feed me. Praise God. I know who's going to uh, wash my clothes. She likes to remind me that of a lot. I know. Amen. Of those things. And today, I'm telling you, we have no secrecies. But now you may find these things that I named. You'll probably find one or more of these traits in a family that 
maybe they are not unhealthy. Maybe they are a healthy family. Time to time, you'll find these things. But most of the time, a dysfunctional family, what they're going to find is these five traits that I named today. And that is estrangement, anger, lack of trust, deception, unhealthy secrecy. And you'll find these dysfunctions. So today, I want to preach just for a few moments, if you allow me, on a dysfunctional family. And today, I believe it, we wouldn't have to look very far in the Scripture to find the meaning of, of a dysfunctional family. And you say, you mean they're in the, in the Bible? Yes. Matter of fact, our text is, and I'm going to end this sermon with our text today, but there's several that's in there. And uh, I don't have to go very far because it's been ever since uh, uh, Adam and Eve disobeyed God. And we know every family has a dysfunctional one to some kind of degree or another. There's some that are worse than others, but how many knows that dysfunctional is dysfunctional? It doesn't matter how off you get or how bad you get. It's just a messed up life. And, and I want to tell you what dysfunctional comes from, Brother Norris, today is this. It is a word called sin that causes dysfunctional. Come on, the best relationships you ever can see. When sin gets involved, it would destroy that relationship. There's no such thing. That's good. Clap your hands. That's good. Let, let me just say, there's no such thing as a perfect family. Sometimes we see all of the things that we want to see, and we think, man, I wish I had a family like that. I wish I had a perfect family like Brother Hunt's got. They all listened and obeyed him and came on up and just sat on the platform. I wish my family was here. But I'm going to tell you, as bad as I hate to admit it, there's probably some know too much perfection in this right here. There's some things that this right here needs to be worked on. And I'm going to tell you, I done made up my mind. God, if there's anything Brother Hunt needs to situate and work on, you let me know. If you want to talk to this family, you let me know, God. I really appreciate if you come through me and tell me, hey, something ain't right here. Something is not moving right because I want to hear what God has from me. But I realize today there's no such thing as a perfect family. Neither has there ever been and it never will be as long as there's sin that's roaming in this earth. As long as sin is a part of human condition. Sin distorts everything. It distorts everything. Sin messes up life. Needless to say, my friend, it, it is colors of life. Uh, uh, it, sin messes up marriages. Can I hear amen? Sin messes up families. There's no parent or child or relationship that is truly perfect. Even though we would like to say, I've got a perfect grandchild. And right now he is, as long as he's sleeping and not crying. He's perfect. But there's sometimes in life we just have to stop. Moms, dads, grandmas, grandpas, sometimes we just have to stop and say, you know what? My grandbaby needs prayer. God's got to deliver him from that deception and those things that we're going to talk about here in a few moments. And sin is a thing that's coming against this world, and we're trying to cover it up with pretty things. And, but I'm going to tell you, the only thing that can cover sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. It'll cover it. But there's dysfunctional families, and I'm going to go through these real quick because I, I know you've heard of all these. But dysfunctional families are in the Bible. And, and like I said, the first family is Adam and Eve. They blamed each other. You talked about that this morning in Sunday school. They blamed each other for their disobedience. It's amazing to me when somebody can't do something right, they blame it on somebody else. Church, when are we going to grow up and take responsibility of our own mistakes? Come on. Then you go consider their children, Cain. We know murdered his brother Abel. Consider Noah, the three sons. Ham disgraced his father by uncovering his nakedness. Consider Abraham, father of all nations. Abraham and Sarah, he lied about his wife, calling him his sister. Then consider Abraham's nephew, Lot. He turned uh, out to be a major disappointment to Uncle Abraham. Consider David, although he was a great king, and he was, but he was a great warrior, and he was. He was a great poet, and he was. You know what? He was a father, and he was a husband, but you know what? All through that, he was a failure. A man after God's own heart, he was a failure. His marriage to Michael or Michelle, however you want to say it, was largely a, fa a failure. His marriage to Bathsheba was based on adulterous affair that he had. His son Absalom turned against him. His kingdom crumbled after all of this. And guess what? So did his family because all of the dysfunctional things that was going on in his life. 
And then we see right there, there's three generations of a, of a family that was dysfunctional. Families that was dysfunctional. All through the scripture you can find him. And I believe even in our text today we find a dysfunctional family talking about Jacob and Esau. They started out uh, two genera or they started out generation before them was Abraham and Sarah. We know the story. This dysfunctional begins with Sarah unable to conceive and Abraham he, he sleeps with Hagar we can go through these real quick but Sarah uh, had chose that said you go have me a baby I need a baby I need it now so she had Abraham said you go sleep with a maid and I want to have a baby I can't do it I'm too old and Abraham did and when Abraham goes into Hagar guess what a son is created whose name we know was Ishmael the result of relationship causes so much strain between Sarah and Hagar that Hagar, she begins to get out of the picture, runs away for a minute, a length of time that she runs away. She gives birth to Ishmael, and, and she, re, she was restored unto Sarah, and, then gives birth, and Sarah gives birth to Isaac. And at that point, we know Abraham's uh, response to Sarah was complaints that sends Hagar and Ishmael away for good at that second time she left. And I want you to pack them up and get them out of here because now I've got my own baby. I don't need them. Here's a, just a family of dysfunctional things that's going on. So but what was going on in here? Not only Sarah and Hagar... They didn't get along. Neither did Ishmael or Isaac get along. If you go back and study it out, you'll find it. I'm, I'm kind of touching between the lines here. But we pass now to the second generation that we're going to talk about tonight, which, which Isaac marries Rebekah. And after 20 years, she gives birth to what, who is called Jacob and Esau. Now, these boys, they were very different. Does anybody have kids that are just alike? Would you raise your hand? I didn't think so. Why? Because every one of your kids, Brother Derek, are different. They ask for things different. They try to act to, to try like the younger one does. And, and well, maybe I get it if I get it this way. And, but every child is different. I got three young men that are hard workers in their life. They work really hard. They work for what they got. And they're like me. If you steal what they got, they will shoot you. Because they work hard for what they get. But they're hard workers. But guess what? They're all different. They all think different. And every one of them, I've said these words. What were you thinking? And probably in their mind I'm thinking what's best for me we all have different thoughts but we come to Genesis chapter 27 and I would encourage you to read that chapter later today when you get home and and, and fig, figure out a lot of these things that I'm reading between the line on but these three generations of family dysfunction are about to come to a fearful climax right here and I want to show you things we want to know why our world's in a mess it didn't start with President Obama and I know some of you are thinking, well, he sure had a lot of help in it. But no, that ain't where it started. That's not where it started. You, you need to go back and say, what was these boys thinking? What was Abraham thinking? It's been since the time. Dysfunctional has been since the time. These patterns of unhealthy relationships ultimately, my friend, would destroy Jacob's own family. If you begin to study it out, and, and we're going to show you some things, but there are four characteristics here in this story that Isaac, or four, four characters in this story, it was Isaac, it was the uh, father, Rebekah the mother, and the two sons, Jacob and Esau. But I want you to notice something. There's four, these four characters, all four presented in a negative light in this chapter. All four of them. Not just Jacob, not just Esau, and not mom and dad, but all four of them. These four people, have you ever known? This is what, what dawned on me, Sister Mary. In this chapter, these four people never appeared together at the same time. You never hear of a dinner being set a table set with two kids and a mom and dad. They never was together. It was either mama and uh, Esau or Jake, uh, Jacob and daddy, or most time it was uh, mama and Jacob because, you know, Jacob was a mama's boy. But these never appeared at the same time in that chapter. For, furthermore, throughout the time, Jacob and Esau are now far separated a relationship that never appeared together at all. They never, even after this happened, they never came back to the point, and we know when that happened, and I'm not going to get that far in the story, but this is a, I believe, is a picture of a perfect dysfunctional family. If you really want to look at a perfect dysfunctional family, go back to Esau and Jacob here, and the sinful patterns that begin to happen, and things begin to flow through this, the deception, and, and, and guess what? It never was confronted or resolved, so it got worse and worse. And if you go on and find in, in uh, 27 and 1 that we read, we're talking about disobedience. The story begins in our text with Isaac believing that he's about to die. Isaac then had in his mind, I'm going to die. How many said that in the last two months, I feel like I'm going to die? 
Yeah, we all have. We, we, we get that in our mind. And the devil wants everybody in this room today to think that you're going to die. Some of you might even thought it this morning. Wrote, before you wrote up, oh, I think I'm going to die. Well, guess what? I think I'm going to live today and not die. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. That's what I want to set in my mind. But his fondest dreams ensure that uh, before he dies, this is what Isaac was saying, before I die, Esau must obtain and cherish the blessing that I have for him. Now, you got to think about this. Uh, the uh, uh, old and frail he was, his sight began to fail him, and he called Esau in, and, and he sends him out for the hunt. I want you to go out and do what you do best, son. Go get me something to eat. And, and Isaac says, uh, uh, prepare me the, the, ki the, the, uh, the kid, uh, the kind, the tasty food that I love. Bring it to me to eat that I might give you a blessing because I'm about to die, son. You better go get it. Now, his intentions are very clear here, and Isaac wants Esau to have the rights to the first uh, firstborn after Isaac. Uh, uh, is dead. He wants him to have that. Now, in sending this, him out to hunt his game, he's asking him uh, what was the firstborn son should do. And he said, take his place in the head, provider for the family. And once his son here was, was prepared the meal, and Isaac would then be the free to give the blessing out after the meal was prepared. So what's wrong with that? What, what, what's going on? Originally, nothing would be wrong with that. Nothing would be wrong with it, but God had already spoken. If you'll go back, and this is going to blow some of you scholars' mind, but go back and study it out. God had already spoken and declared before the boys were born, the older one will serve the younger one. He already declared that, and that meant that Jacob should be treated to be the firstborn. Throughout all the years, Isaac was evidently never being willing to accept God's choice of Jacob and Esau, or over Esau. But now the last plans to give Esau the blessing. Think about these for a little bit tonight. We're talking about a dysfunctional family today. In doing this, Isaac is making uh, four mistakes here. He's clearly trying to overturn what God had said. Church, I'm going to tell somebody here today, you better hear your pastor. You better quit trying to overturn what God is telling us to do. You're going to mess up something. <laughs> And you know why you don't know what tomorrow holds? And I don't know what tomorrow holds? Because you'd mess it up and I'll mess it up. That's why God says you just go ahead and start walking and I'll take care of everything that's in front of you. Friend, I come to tell somebody that you don't know what tomorrow holds, uh, but my God does. And he's already got it in line. He's already got it in, in figuration today. <laughs> Hallelujah. My Lord, it may blow your mind, but I, just, I, I believe this young man right here that's holding this baby, that baby one day is going to be the drum player of Cargill First Pentecost Church. Somebody said, we don't have that long to wait. But hey, if, whatever it takes, God, we're here. But hear me today. It's clearly that we shouldn't overturn God's idea. He, he, he is rude completely by his senses, God is. He ignores the fact. Now here we is. Jacob ignores the fact that Esau or Isaac ignores the fact that Esau is spiritually unqualified for the blessing. Sometimes we got to remember something. Everybody's not qualified to sing. Even though you may like to sing, don't mean you ought to be singing. Everybody's not qualified to preach. Even though you would like to get up here and just yell out in this microphone like Brother Hunt does. But that doesn't mean you're qualified. But sometimes we think we are, and we deserve it. And Jacob, he conspires in the secret, or, or Isaac does, in the secret with Esau. And he hides his plan back and says, hey, I want you to have it because you're my favorite son. You're the one that's going to do this. And, and, and so he began to do it out uh, a little secretly. And, and there's that secret. Church, I'm telling you, if you've got secrets in your family, that's why you're having family problems. If you're not having family problems, you're going to have family problems. As soon as the wife finds the secret or the husband finds out the secret, somebody's going to be messed up. Oh, God. I could preach there a while, but that's not what I come to preach. None of this matters to Isaac that I just named to you. He wants the favorite son for the blessing, to have the blessing. And he was convinced that, you know, whatever I got to do, if I got to connive it to make it happen or convive it to whatever I got to do, exactly what, what will it take? I will do it. If he has to deceive his wife or his other son, Jacob, I will do that. It doesn't matter. And you can find this if you read uh, 5 through 29 of that same chapter in our, our text today. But the plan didn't work out because Rebecca was eavesdropping over the conversation. She was at the door listening what dad was telling his favorite son. And we know the story of how it happened, but give me just a minute to over, overlook it. She, she repeats it to Jacob 
Say, this is what I overheard. And then she herself, Rebecca, mama, begins to cook, cook up her own schism for the family. Now, none of you mamas do this, I know. And when, when the daddy's getting ready to punish the boy, you're not over thinking, now, what can I do to get him out of this whipping? And what can I do to correct this? Now, none of y'all do that, I know. But this is where Rebecca was. Rebecca was over cooking up in her mind. You know, I know what needs to happen, Jacob. Uh, you go out and get the goats out of the pasture in the back uh, real quick before I, uh, Esau has time to go hunt. And you go get everything prepared. And you come back in, and I'll cook it up for you because I know just how your daddy likes it. And I know I'll make the meal so tasty he can't resist it. So we know Jacob will serve his father while pretending to be his brother. And he did. He went serving him and tricking Isaac and giving him to give him the blessing. Give it to me. And we understand this dysfunctional family begin to start happening right there. But when Jacob hears this amazing plan, guess what he done? He woes out and he does exactly what mama says. And he, but he says these words to his mama. He said, hey, what's going to happen if he touches me? Because you see, Esau is real hairy. What's going to happen if he touches me? What's going to happen? And then mom began to think again. Well, we can think of something, surely. And Jacob evidently, uh, no moral objection to the idea of deceiving his father. He wanted to know how we're we going to get by this little trick. Church, can I tell you something? We just need to obey God's word and quit trying to get around God's word. It's not easy living God's word sometimes. We need to quit trying to deceive ourselves and go ahead and just do what the Bible says do and quit playing the games with God and say, God, I just want to do what your word says. Uh, and we got to get to where it is, church. we got to do it. He just wants to know what does it take? What, what is, what's going to happen if I get caught? But remember his words. He says these in, our, in that chapter. You remember the words. Uh, I would appear to be deceiving him if I go in like I am. That's the wrong answer because really what it is, he, he was deliberately deceiving him. And too many people, not only uh, I might be deceiving, but we're deliberately trying to deceive what God calls uh, for us to do. But we must notice here that uh, uh, who, who changed or who charged, uh, uh, who was in charge of this deception that was taking place? Who really was it? Was it Jacob? I come to tell the church today, Mama was the one who was in, doing all the, uh, the, the wrong deception here. We say, well, I don't know about that, but, but you know, uh, I'm going to tell you, Rebecca, when, she, when he says, but a curse will come up on me if I get caught, Rebecca, y'all remember what Rebecca said in her words? She says this, you just do what I say. Some of the mama's favorite words, you just do what I say. And guess what? When mama says that, these boys knew back home, I better get it done because if, if, then if I don't, I got to suffer the consequence. So he said, you just do as I say. So clearly Rebecca is in this, uh, uh, well, she was a, a dominant leader of the family. Listen to me, and just to summarize her personality in these four words, is this. She was strong, she was resourceful, she was decisive, and she was cunning. She is the prime mover here of the story. She was the main one that pushed this story to make it happen as well as it did. And we thought of deception, you know, Jacob was the one deception. He was the cheater. We can talk about his name. But Rebecca's the one who had all the deception and pushing the family. I'm going to tell you, we need some more men to stand back up in the family and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. <laughs> can I tell you today, I believe women are wanting men to take the stand back and say, let's go worship God. Let's go worship the Lord. Hey, you stay here if you want, but me and my family, we're going over here, and we're just going to worship God together because we believe here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and I think I'm ready to see that happening in our lives. So here we are. A woman is strong, resourceful, decisive. She's cunning. She's got everything together, and she's, just, she's so deception. But who said, who was it that said, go get the food to Jacob? It was Rebecca. Who said, put, put on the goat skin. We're going to deceive your daddy and make him think that you're Esau. It was Rebecca. Who said, let the blame fall on me. It was Rebecca. Because Rebecca already knew she had the resources to make daddy okay again. But who said, leave home till Esau coos off and, and he'll be all right. It was Rebecca. And every point she began to charge him to go forth and she always had answers for every question and solution and problem you don't have to worry about it god uh, this is it i got it taken care of but one question is was so brazenly wrong was why did jacob do it 
What pushed him to do it? Because he was under the pressure from his mother, probably. Because he wanted to be the blessing so badly. I want it. I got to have it. I got to have the feel good because he believed that the end justified uh, uh, means that I'm going to get something. I'm going to have a blessing because he didn't respect his father, maybe, sufficiently. And, and I, think, I think Jacob said to himself, God wants me to have the blessing. I believe that's why he did it. Because God meant for Jacob to have the blessing. And this is going to blow some of your minds, especially our spiritual minds. So you're going to have to really get where I'm at today. But God wants me to have the blessing today. God wants you to have the blessing today. Well, I don't deserve it, Brother Hunt. I ain't prayed this week. I've done things I shouldn't have done. I'm not living where I should be. I got news for you. God wants you to have the blessing today. He wants your family to be blessed. He wants the man to be blessed. He wants to bless you today. Come on. He wants to bless you today. I got I to hurry today, but, but sometimes we feel if I got to cheat a little bit to get it, that's all right. God understands. You know, Jake, Jacob was half right. Uh, God, didn't want, did, God did want him to have the blessing. He did. It was a plan that he had laid out. And God did understand what he was doing, but he di it didn't make it right for what he has done. It doesn't make it right, but God understood this to make this happen. So what happens next is so well known that, that it, hardly, it hardly needs to be repeating. But listen to me for a moment. Jacob's wearing the, the goat skin prepared for his mother, carries the tasty food to his father Isaac, although he is old and deceptive, senses and was going away, and, and, and something went wrong. In the middle of all of this, uh, his mind tells him Esau couldn't have got that game so fast. He knew that was a fast trip to get back, and, uh, and on top of that, he knew that the voice didn't sound like Esau. Isaac was there, but he knew something wasn't right. Have you ever come in your life, in spiritual life, that you took a time out and said, wait a minute, wife, I know something just ain't right. Something ain't sounding right. The move of God ain't going just right. Things are not happening the way that they should. Church, I'm going to tell you, don't never lose. Don't never lose that, that discernment that something ain't right in my family. Don't ever lose that something, we're not doing what we used to. I'm not feeling what I used to feel. Don't lose that discernment. But he was there and Esau knew that, hey, something just, just ain't right. So Jacob deceives his father. It was deliberate deception. It wasn't an accident to deceive him. You know, he went in and says, I am the firstborn. And think about this. It was even blasphemy when he went in because the Lord your God gave he says, gave me success to go get this real fast and come back. So he began to blaspheme what his father was saying. And he repeated the deception because he says, are you really Esau, my son? And what did he say? Yeah, I am. Dishonesty began to t pop in. And so he went to him and he kissed him. And he says, hey, it's me. It's me. And, and so many times we feel that we're going to be all right. But see, I'm telling you, you might deceive me. And you might deceive that family member sitting by you. But I want to tell somebody something. i got a God that you cannot deceive. He knows your heart inside and out. He knows where you're at. <laughs> Misleading detail was Isaac caught his smell of his clothes. Because he thought, man, he has been hunting because I smell it, the wild on him. But this should be no surprise to us in this life because this is what happens whenever you set off the path of deception. And you try to deceive. I'm going to tell you something. And I feel the Holy Ghost to say this. Some of us even deceive ourselves. To think that I'm all right doing what I'm doing. Everything's fine. We deceive. But this, this, this follows whenever you say it doesn't matter how. As long as we do it, church, it does matter how. God has a role model laid before us. He has a, he has a way that seemeth right. And this is where we're at today. There's a way that seemeth right to man, but then man falls into the way that's not right. But God has a way that's right. Jacob lies around bound to what happened. And he decided that it, the, it, it, whatever happens in the end, and so he began to justify everything is good. Soon one lie we know led to another, and another finally had kept on lying and cover up his previous lies. Friend, I'm telling you, if you ever tell a lie, you'll tell another one to cover it up. In many cases, Isaac set his doubts, and everybody has these doubts aside, and he gives Jacob, thinking that he's Esau, the blessing, and the blessing basically involves three things, personal prosperity, preeminency, and protection by God. In essence, Jacob was now to receive Isaac's blessing and revealed that, that covenant that, that Abraham had begun to lay out before him. And he said, now I've got it. And as I read through this passage, I wonder about this story. And I begin to think, who is really deceiving whom here? 
who is really the deceiver? We know Jacob was the cheater and deceiver, but but one hand, Jacob definitely was deceiving his father. But however, as I told you, Isaac began to, uh, as he thinks that Jacob was, was really Esau, and he thinks he's deceiving Jacob, but by this, he was really blessing Esau, to, or giving the blessing to Jacob. Now both intend on this to deceive one another. Only Jacob succeeds, as we see. The most amazing point that through this uh, act of deception is this. God's will was done. And does that not blow your mind? As I have read the Bible through many a times these past two years, as I begin to read the Bible through, it's almost like God has been beginning to illuminate these pages in my face and begin to show me of dysfunctional things that has brought his will to pass. And you and I are trying to judge. I think maybe that's one of the reasons we're not supposed to judge our brother because we don't know why God put him through that situation to get him to where he's at today. Come on, we don't know. Come on, somebody. Nobody wants to go to prison. But Joseph, sometimes you got to go there before you get there. Come on, nobody wants to go in the, in the lion's den, but sometimes you got to fight lions and, and lay beside lions uh, before you can get there. Nobody wants to face a sickness, Sister Hunt, but it was, sometimes we got to go through it before I can realize uh, my God is a healer. Come on, if I didn't, if, oh, hallelujah. If I never was sick, uh, I wouldn't believe God is a healer. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, can I preach on for a minute? If I never was broke, I wouldn't believe God could supply my need according to his riches that are in glory. Yeah. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. You got to be there before you know what's happening. Oh, I got to preach today, but I want to tell you, my friend, we, who was deceiving who? Who was there? God's choice. I believe God had, had made all this happen. He did, in fact. The sin of blessing. This doesn't justify deception. I'm not saying deceive me or deceive your brother, deceive your wife. I'm not justifying anything, uh, but I'm going to tell you, friend, what it does. Uh, my friend, it, 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 it don't justify deception, but it does demonstrate how God works through weakness of sinful men to accomplish his purpose. Come on, if he's got to sell a casino to, 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 or, or sell a church to a casino to build the church bigger, he'll do it. Now, some of us would, would get out of the church today. If I sold this property for, for $5 million to the next casino, some of you get mad. So I can't believe it. But I'm going to tell you, I help them load the slot machines in for $5 million. You understand? Oh, Brother Hunt, that's ridiculous. But come on, God is going to prepare a way through whatever he has to. Go back and read your Bible. Everybody he goes through, he goes through it, and he begins to supply things. And he, he used sinful, weak men and women to bring it to pass. And he does. He reminds me of the words Joseph utterly said years later. And I didn't give you this, but you remember when Joseph said these words, what they meant for evil, God meant it for good. The devil wants to destroy you guys. And the devil's going to put things on you. And I'm going to tell you, and you wouldn't believe the things that people meant for evil in my life. Uh, but God said, I'll turn it around. I, I, I'll turn it around. It'll be in your favor. I remember. I remember 14 years ago having about an hour-long phone call with a certain man, and we was talking about different things, and I got off the phone, and I got by my bed, and I said, God, you're the only one that knows everything, and you know what needs to happen, and what was about to happen was going to be against me. It was going to, it was going to destroy, maybe possibly even the church, but you know what God told me when I got up off my knees? He said, don't you worry about it. What's about to happen is going to be in your favor. Come on, somebody preached the other day about the favor of God. I thank God I got favor of him on my life today. There's favor on me today from God. The Bible says, Isaac, when Esau came back, finally got back from hunting, he's been out there working hard, got his things together, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to close off real quick here. But he says, he got back in and said, here I am, Daddy. He said, who are you? He said, no, Esau's done been here. Oh, no, it's me. I am really Esau. And he realized right away what Jacob had done done because Jacob had done deceived him before in the past. It says Jacob has done been here. And he and then they said that the Bible says, read it. The Bible says that he shook so hard. He was just so mad, Isaac was. Oh, I can't believe he did this to me. 
But guess what Esau did? Esau began to, no doubt, I'm probably by the bed, probably hitting dad on the chest. Come on, daddy. You got to give me that blessing. I got to have that blessing. We know what Jacob is. He was a cheater. He's a deceiver. He's a, he done tricked me out of my birthright anyway. Now, you know, I declare today, if Jacob would have protected his birthright a little better than what he did, he probably wouldn't have went through that situation he had to go through. Church, you better protect your Holy Ghost. The world's telling you it's not like it used to be, but it is. The same Holy Ghost that fell on me when I was 12 years old, I, I feel that same Holy Ghost today. It's in this house. Uh, the anointing of God is still real. i got to protect what God's given me. I want my family to feel the Holy Ghost when I preach, when I sing, when I worship, when I pray. I want them to feel it when they sing. And, and Come on, somebody. we got to protect what we got. And we know how Esau was so upset. Give it to me, Daddy. And we know that Jacob means a cheater. And Esau says, it's rightfully named Jacob because we know what he's done. He's uncheated me. And listen, friend, the devil's out to cheat you today. He's out to destroy you today. Listen, before you feel sorry for Esau because he lost his blessing, don't feel sorry for him. Because you've got to ask yourself the question, who caused this problem? It's because when he was, he sold off earlier in that situation. We've got to remember, my friend... Mama knew her boy. Mama knew the situation. Mama thought she knew him because she said when he coos off, you, he, you could come back. He told Jacob, you can come back when he coos off. But we know how the story, he went 500 miles away and he began to work there and he, uh, where Uncle Laban was. And, and we know the story, how he began to uh, labor there and never came back home. And I don't have time to go into where finally him and his brother made up, but he didn't make up. With Esau, and I'm going to tell you this. I said a little bit in, in our in our trip we went on this weekend to the men. I says, you know what? Uh, it was the time that he wrestled with that angel. He had him a God moment. Church, I'm going to tell you what the problem is with the United States of America. People don't have God moments no more. We don't have God moments anymore. We have we have my moments, I moments. Come on, how many's ever said, I just need some time alone? I need to just get away. You take care of the baby a while today. I need to go soak in the bathtub a while. Uh, I need this. You, it's your time to clean the house. I need to just get away. I, I need to go. And how many's ever just dreamed land on Hawaii, uh, a beach somewhere with, with nobody around? And just oh, It's all about me all about me I it's what I need and sometimes in life it's all about what I need but church can I tell you today I refuse to come to church because of who I am I come to church and preach today because who he is and I worship him when I come to church. I magnify him when the songs are sung, when the preachers preach it, when the teachers are teaching. I'm doing it all for him because guess what? It's about him. When you and I, when you and I learn the thing like learn this, it's not about me. It's not even how I feel today. But it's about him who died for my sins. If the music get ready and come, I've got a lot more notes. I told you I had, I'm, I'm not kidding. I could preach all day long right here off of this. Jacob's family was destroyed. He was penniless. He was homeless. He's fleeing for his life. He's been estranged uh, from his brother for years. He has humility, you know, by his father. He's humi humi humiliated by his father, I'm sorry. As far as we know, he was never saw his mother, Rebecca, again, as far as we know, according to the Scripture. My favorite son, I don't ever see him again, because Jacob left Esau, stayed at home. But I want you all to catch this. You know what Jacob did? Jacob forfeited all of the materialism property that he would have got him if he would just stay home and got an inheritance. Too often we leave before God says. I'm talking about spiritually in our life. I'm not talking about physical right now. God's got a spiritual anointing for you. And I believe if you'll hang on, it's coming. Jacob got what he wanted, but he lost his own family. Because he wouldn't wait on God. He lost his own family. Church, can I tell you today in closing, waiting is one of the hardest disciplines for a Christian to do and I want to raise both my I don't like waiting 
Especially in those times that God says, do now, we better do it. But I don't like waiting. That's one of the hardest things to do. Psalms 37, 15 says, be still before the Lord. Go, go read it. I think it says, it says, wait patiently for him. Be still. Everybody look at your spouse and say, be still. I can't understand it, but if I wait on the Lord, I don't know. And y'all, y'all remember the scripture in Isaiah where he says, them that wait up on the Lord shall renew their strength. So I, I can't quote it word for word. It says, mount up with eagle wings. Come on. We wait for the Lord. God. You know why? How many has ever had chickens growing up? Anybody ever had chickens? We had about 175 in Germantown one day. Right over here on next door to Hughes where I lived when I was a kid. And uh, I remember having to catch those chickens, Sister Turner. And we had to catch them. You probably don't know nothing about this stuff. Had to catch them chickens and mama say, hold that wing out, boy. And we cut them wings short. You know why? We'd only do one side. It was funny, too. You'd cut one side of that chicken's wing. They try to fly that coop. They go like this, right back into the coop. Because the wings are uneven. They fly uneven. But you know what? When you wait on God, I feel this in the Holy Ghost, y'all. While I'm waiting on God, you know what's happening? Guess what, brother? <laughs> Hallelujah. Guess what, Pastor Ash? Ah, they're growing. They growing. Ah. If I could, Brother Patton, I climb on the platform today. And I would just fly out across the congregation and let you know. But I hear the Lord saying, just wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait. Some of you wondering, where is my life here going from here? When we wait on God. We will have what we need from God. He said, wait, be still, be patient. Most of us don't want to be still, and we don't want to wait. We want to an answer, and we want it right now. While this story, no doubt, speaks probably to many levels in our lives, and no doubt some of the things that I named today probably hit your family. And guess what? When I begin to go over these, I said, there's probably, there will be no family there today that don't have some of these issues. And we can look at the truth and we can look at it positively or we can look at it negatively. I don't know why I'm going through this. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know where it's at. Can I tell you? Oh, I don't know why I'm all over the place, but listen to me. God wants me to tell somebody, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I like what he said. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. Oh, He said, if I prepare a place for you, he said, I'm going to come again. I'm going to receive you unto myself. That where I am, brother, brother Zambica, there you may be also. Can I tell you something? Somebody said, you're talking about a funeral message. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm talking about Jesus said, I will prepare a place for you. Can I tell somebody today? God has prepared. Come on. October the 9th, 2016 for you today. You are supposed to be here today. This sermon is supposed to be for you today. I hear the Lord telling me, you may think your family's dysfunctional and there's no hope for you, uh, but my God says, I am your hope. Uh, I am your love. Uh, I am your truth. Uh, I am your way. Uh, I am your supplier. Uh, I am the one that you need today. My God is here today and he has your answer today. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Will we all stand today? If God wants Jacob to have the blessing, there's no way Isaac could ever get it if God wanted Jacob to have it. No way. It can't happen. Not in a million years. God's, God doesn't need Jacob's help or Rebecca's either to make that happen. What had to happen, had to happen. And I'm going to tell you, next Sunday, I, probably, I don't know if I should announce this or not, but next Sunday, I will have a political message next Sunday. I will. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to rebuke you who you vote for. I'm not going to tell you who to go vote for. 
That's going between you and God and your, you know, whatever happens there. But next, next, next Sunday, there's going to be a flag about as big as this platform, as big as this platform on this platform, and we will be talking about the country we live in. And I don't know about you, I'm glad to have a country that we can worship God freely in today. And by the end of my sermon, you'll know who I'm voting for, but I won't tell you who to vote for. I don't, I don't believe that's right. Uh, I could tell you Sunday who you better vote for, but I ain't going to tell you who to vote for. Praise God. With all that being said today, I'm going to ask you. It's only 1219, 1221, something like that. I'm going to ask you today, is your family perfect? Well, why do you think the family behind you should be perfect? Why do you think the brother across the way should be perfect? Come on, you done said yours ain't perfect. Why do you think the other guy should be perfect? Can I tell you, Pastor Hunt has made some stupid mistakes. Nobody say amen. Nobody say amen. But you know what? God turned that for good. God said, poor brother Hunt, he did it again. Poor guy. I'm going to go to his rescue again. He did it again. Poor guy. And thank God he has mercy and he has grace. And he turns my mess. Y'all going to like this. He turns my mess, Brother John, into a message. Anybody like your mess to be turned into a message today? Guess what? I'm looking at about 155 people today that God says, I can make your mess a message. How many is ready for God to do that in your life? You're sitting with your family today. I want you to, we're going to come as a family to the altar. There's no, no special place. Just bring your family. The closest you can get to the altar. It's almost like the water's been troubled. The first one comes, gets it. Boom. You better start moving. You better start moving. Bring your family. Bring your family. And you get to this altar. I want to pray for these families today. Dysfunctional families. My family, stay with me right here. We're going to pray right here. Dysfunctional. Things are not perfect, TJ, Skylar, Josh. And I'm sorry for all the mistakes your daddy's made. I've done things I wish I could redo. I can't. But I can change from this day forward. I can make my family better prayer warriors. Oh, God, help me. You that are coming to this altar today, would you bring your mom, dad, your children? If somebody don't have a child, bring them with you. Or a dad, bring them with you. I want us to pray for our families. I want you to pray for that one you're holding a hand with or arm around. And I want you to say, God, I just want to go to heaven with my wife and my son and my daughter and my husband. I just want to go to heaven. We've been dysfunctional, but you know what, God? I'm going to give you my life today. I don't understand all this Pentecostal stuff, and I don't understand where I'm going from here, but God, if I could just get to that cross with my family, I know I'll be all right. I just got to go, God. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray for my family. Would you guys grab hands? Lord, in the name of Jesus, I just bind with my family today. Lord, I believe you want to touch my family. Of your sweet Holy Spirit. Oh, let it purify and heal. I give myself completely now. Take me, Lord. I'm yours. I'm yours. I'm yours. It's your anointing, Lord. Oh, yes. It's your anointing, Lord. Oh, it's your anointing, Lord, that I long for. Sweet Holy Spirit, oh, let it purify, purify it you. I give myself completely now. Take me, Lord, I'm yours, I'm yours, I'm yours. 
Cause it's your anointing Oh 